Zach again at NewTutorial.com. I want to come in and do a video for you today. You know, it's about every year uh, during the feast times, I get about a dozen emails uh, during those times, uh, each during each one of those times, from people who tell you, you know, we can't keep Passover, we can't keep Sukkot, we can't keep Shavuot, we can't keep these, these feast times of unleavened bread, um, we can't keep the Moedim, and... Uh, and so it, it's, I've done responses on this before. I know, I know. And I, we just got done with Passover. We just got done with unleavened bread uh, here on the farm. And I've, uh, uh, you know, I've done videos on this on this in the past addressing this topic. Obviously, it's not enough. I still get these emails, or people just don't watch the videos. They don't go back to the, in the archives. Or they, they don't search the website. Um, so, and that's fair. I mean, you know, new people are coming all the time, and they're and new people are discovering some of the verses in Deuteronomy 12 and 16, and they're saying, hey. You know, what is this? It says this. You know, why are we doing this? And it says this. And, and there's some very clear answers for that. And I've tried to explain to some people, but I think there's some teachers out there who are teaching. And really, what I have seen increase over the course of the last uh, year or so is an apologetics developed by Christian people, Christian pastors, Christian teachers out there who are very much against Torah, who are very much against Hebrew roots, who are using this argument right here to dissuade people from keeping the feast days. Uh, of course, they want you keeping Christmas and Easter, but um, you know if they can if they can keep you from doing the feast, that's even that's that's good enough. So. You know, so I've seen a big movement out of Christianity and apologists out of Christianity, people who do not like Torah, do not like Hebrew roots or any of that stuff or Messianic Judaism, whatever. They, they don't they don't like you keeping the feast. And so they're making this argument to dissuade you. And I, I think that's where a lot of people are going off. But then there are some Torah people who I guess call themselves scholars or teachers or whatever who are also teaching this. And I think it's an error, big error. And I want to kind of run through some things some verses because some things have been brought to my attention that I want to address that I didn't address in my other videos. And I did a video called Why or I Can't Keep Passover or something like that uh, back a few months back or so. Anyway, <coughs> anyway, so what I wanted to address is uh, a couple of verses in in the scriptures. People will automatically come to you and say, Zach, it says right here, Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 16, you can't keep the feast unless you're in the land in the place where he puts his name. Okay, um, Understand the context of that. The context of that is that they're right at the Jordan River. They haven't crossed over yet. And Moses is going over the commandments with these people, like just like he went over with their for, with their fathers and, and their ancestors who were in the wilderness. And these people, he's making it clear to them, you know, for the feast days, you know, when it comes to Deuteronomy 12 and 16, and Deuteronomy 16, that, it, hey, listen, these are to be kept in the land, in the place where he puts his name. That's it. Well, that's for them going into the land. Each of these people are getting an inheritance. Each of these people are getting a slice of property out of the promised land. And it's being clear, when you get your property, you're not allowed to keep these feasts in your gates. No. You need to go to Jerusalem with everybody else and have the feast together. This is a time of fellowship and worship, you know, congregational worship that you need to take part in. Now, let me ask you this. Where did the first Passover happen? It happened in Egypt while they were in captivity. Where did the second Passover happen? It happened in the wilderness when they were going towards or getting ready to come into the promised land. So we can go to Numbers chapter 9 real quick and look at this. Uh, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month, at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all of the rites of it, and according to all of the ceremonies thereof, shall ye keep it. Now, we see right here, this is talking about the second year, okay, the first month, and it's talking about Passover. They're doing Passover in the wilderness. There's no doubt about it. And the second thing that's very interesting here, in verse 3, in the fourteenth day of this month, at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all of the rites of it, and according to all of the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. According to all of the rites and all of the ceremonies. Some versions, if you have an NIV, it says rules and regulations. Well, what are the rules and regulations of Passover? It's detailed very clearly in Exodus chapter 12. It gives you all the things you need to do for Passover. All the way you, you do Passover. Even as a memorial, it says. Okay, because you're not do the first Passover is already over. And our Messiah came as the Passover lamb. So how do we as the people of God who are commanded to keep Passover, keep Passover? Well, it gives us very clear rites uh, and ceremonies, rules and regulations that we are to keep for Passover. 
it says right there, all the rites and ceremonies. So, well, people were like, well, Zach, we're not in the land, so how do we keep it? Well, the first Passover was kept in Egypt, in captivity. Where are we today? We're in captivity. We're in the dispersion. We, we have been scattered to the four corners of the earth and are now, again, waking up to Torah. Knowledge is increasing. We're waking up to Torah again, and we're going back to these rules and going, man, we need to be keeping this stuff. Well, how do we keep it? Exodus chapter 12 tells you. It's a memorial, and here's how you carry out that memorial. Pretty simple. And while we're in, we're, we're in dispersion, we're in captivity, we're in the wilderness, and we know the prophets over and over and over again are talking about a second exodus, a second time when God will gather the remnant of his people and bring them back to the land from all the four corners of the earth. So for those of you out there who say, well, we can't keep the Passover, and if we do, we shouldn't, shouldn't definitely eat a lamb, and we shouldn't put blood over our doorpost, and, you know, we shouldn't, you know, stay in the house until morning. That's all crazy stuff. That's, that was all for the first. Well, it says right here for the rites and the ceremonies. All the rites and the ceremonies need to be followed. All the rules and regulations, if you have an NIV, it says that. So I think it's still applicable to do these things, even, you know, other than what was done in the first one during in, in, while in Egypt, it's also for subsequent ones to do these rites and regulations, these rules and regulations, those rites and ceremonies, again, in the following Passovers that we're to keep forever for throughout all of our generations. It doesn't say only when you're in the land, because it's very clear in Deuteronomy 30 that there's going to come a time when the Father is going to scatter us across the earth because of our disobedience. That has happened. And now we have the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. We're waking up to Torah. We're seeing it again, and we're going, oh! the feast days. These are his feast that we're to keep forever. But still, Zach, we can't keep it. Deuteronomy 12 is very clear. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. See, verse 21 is very, very significant in my opinion. If the place which the Lord thy God has chosen to put thy name be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock, which the Lord has given thee, as I have commanded thee. Well, where did he command that? He commanded it back, back before. And thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So there's a commandment here. So you shall, as I have commanded you, okay, you're going to kill and eat, you know, if you're too far away and you're going to eat whatever your soul lusteth after. Well, you know what? On Passover, I know I'm not in the land. There's no altar there. There's no temple. There's no Levitical system put in place. Even the people there can't keep the Passover. So, but we're to keep it forever throughout all of our generations. And Deuteronomy 30 says there'll come a time, at the first three verses, there'll come a time when people come back to Torah and start to hear and obey. Well, part of that obedience is keeping what he has commanded, verse 21 of Deuteronomy 12, to kill and eat whatever thy soul lusteth. Well, you know, during Passover, my soul lusteth after lamb. I want to have a roasted lamb or a roasted goat of the first year. No bones broken thereof. Right? Well, what's wrong with that? But Zach, Deuteronomy 16. Okay, let's go back to Deuteronomy 16. They get hung up on this verse in verse 5. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God gives thee. Context, people. Context. He's giving this commandment to people who are about ready to enter the land. They're inheriting a slice of, of property that God is giving them. And he's, and they're, he's telling them, when you're in this land, you will keep the Passover where I put my name, wherever my tabernacle is, or later on it's in Jerusalem. That's it. That's the only place you're allowed to do it. You have to come to the feast, he's saying. Don't do this in your own property. You need to come where I am, and there's, there needs to be corporate fellowship and worship. That's what he's saying. And so people get hung up on this. And people who are new to Torah uh, think we shouldn't keep Passover at all. So what are my options, Zach? If we're not to keep Passover... I guess you really have two options. I mean, if you're if you're of this mindset, we can't keep the feast. Let's just let's just use Passover as an example and unleavened bread. You can sit at home when the time comes and twiddle your thumbs and not do anything. Just sit there and go, huh? It's Passover. Well, I really, yeah, I know a bunch of people over there are getting together, and you know, it sounds like a good time. But you know, God says not to do that, and so they're sinning. You know, by getting together and doing this, and fellowshipping and worshiping our God. In, in the diaspora, in captivity. They're worshiping our God. You know, but I'm going to stay at home because that's the right thing to do. Okay, that's your, that's your option number one. Option number two is to get together with a bunch of people and do a Haggadah. Something that's completely made up by man, has no scriptural relevance whatsoever, 
And I mean, there's any, all kinds of Haggadahs. There's a, there's people write their own Haggadahs. Even today, they make up their own. It's it's completely made up by man. And you can keep a Haggadah based on the rabbis or based on somebody else who thinks that they are an authority figure somehow. And and you can keep a Haggadah and maybe eat chicken. You know, okay, that that's really your two options. What am I? And I understand. I know. Don't get upset at me if you're one of these people who live in an apartment who are living in the city, you are living in like the checker box suburbs, you know, where all the houses are the same and they're up against each other. And it's just not really practical for you to bring home a lamb and slaughter it in your backyard. Okay. I get it. I get it. You're in captivity. That's what, that's, that's one of the things that shows you you're in captivity. You cannot do these feasts. You cannot keep some of this Torah right now. That's part of being in captivity is not being able to keep all the commandments that we want to be able to keep. And that's why we desire for him to deliver us out of this captivity and back into the land, which all the prophets say will one day happen. So, again, what, what are you to do? You know, I know uh, Rob Skiba, a good friend of mine, you know, he's having chicken. What else, does he, what else can he do? He lives in an apartment somewhere. Uh, uh, a lot of my friends have just, they're just having chickens. It's all they can do. They don't have access to lamb. They don't have access. They're going to the store. Maybe some people are going and they're buying a rack of lamb or they're buying a leg of lamb or a a uh, shoulder roast of lamb or whatever at their local meat market. That's all they can do. Great. Do what you can do. That's my point, guys. Do what you can do. And understand that one day, one day our Messiah is going to come. And he's going to bring us back to that land. We're, we're going to be gathered from the four corners of the earth. And we're going to go back to that land. And our Messiah is going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And we're going to be able to finally keep Torah the way he teaches us to keep Torah. Outstanding. Great. One day, it's going to happen. But right now, we're in dispersion. So right now, we do the best we can. And uh, some people have gotten offended by that by that phrase that I'm using. Do the best you can. Well, that's not good enough. Okay. It's all you can do. It's all you can do. And so, I, I, you know, I get, again, this is the time of year, the feast times. We just got done with the feast. And people send me emails. I get about a dozen per feast of people saying you can't keep the feast. And here's why. Bang, bang, bang. Here's verses. Bang, 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 bang. And I disagree. I think you're reading things out of context. And really what I think you're doing is avoiding the fellowship, avoiding really, you know, the the desire, the innate desire within ourselves to go out and find like-minded people who love our creator and who want to worship him in the ways he gives us to worship him. And I know all of those ways can't be, can't be accomplished right now, but we can try. We can go out and do the best we can do. And right now, I live on a farm. I do have the ability, like some of you do, some of others of you do, to kill a lamb and to roast it by fire and to not break a bone and to not carry any piece of it outside of the house uh, and to stay in the house until morning and, and to do all of these things, the rites and ceremonies, like it says in Numbers chapter 9, verse 3, you know, or rules and regulations, depending on your version. I have that ability. Uh, I don't have the ability to keep it perfectly, but I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. And what I think would be the biggest tragedy of this, of this awakening that's happening is for people to sit home and avoid fellowship, avoid corporate worship, because they think we can't do it perfectly, so I'm not going to do it at all. That indeed would be, would be a catastrophe, would be sad. So, all right, we're going to leave it at that. I hope that's been encouraging. Uh, I hope you had a great Passover. I hope you had a great unleavened bread. Be encouraged. Do the best you can. That's all the Father is asking us to do. And, and and when we fail, we have grace that saves us. That's our Messiah. It's what he's, he's there for. But we have to do the best. It's the heart. He sees our hearts and sees, hey, we want to keep the feast. We, we've gotten rid of that heart that, that is just full of deception and wickedness. We have a circumcised heart now, a desire to keep his commandments to the utmost of our abilities. That's what he wants from his children. All right, we're going to leave it at that. Go home, read your Bible. Thanks.